welcome to Fresh Perspectives. My name is Gail, and my guest today is Dr. Robert Burke. And uh, the topic of the day is going to be things that are dangerous for our health. Thank you for coming on Fresh Perspectives today. Oh, my pleasure. Today. <clears throat> okay. I, I just finished uh, loading mulch uh, half the morning. I'm happy to take a break. You know? <laughs> loading mulch? Well, mulching around trees. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, it's a long... At it, your own house? Yes, yes, uh -huh. yes, yes. So okay. I have this large pile of mulch that I'm digging into with a pitchfork and moving it around trees. It's uh, an annual... Oh, annual, okay. Uh, I thought you were going swimming before you came. Uh, our swim group uh, <laughs> has stopped for the summer for the because summer. because the institute we swim at the at Turner and the institution starts to get busy now. So, oh, okay. And we have a really active group with Coach Rolland, Bill Rollinger, the former uh, swim coach at, uh, at Jamestown High School. Who's oh. like, we have like 20 something people who swim every Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. Five of us are Ironman competitors. Mm -hmm. Then there's uh, master swimmers mm -hmm. and uh, people who have swum competitively before. And some people who just come and swim with us because they want to learn how to swim better. But it's a fairly um, competitive group and we swim you know, really hard for an hour and then go out and eat afterwards. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> we eat hard for an hour afterwards as well. <laughs> and then the phase three is sometimes a nap in the afternoon because oh, okay. it's a pretty hard workout. But anyway, uh, it's a gr we've been doing it for, I started with him in, must be 2010, he was training someone for an Ironman event and I was training for one. And then we added, we kept adding people, kept adding people and now we're up to 20, all walks of life, you know, mm -hmm. doctors, lawyers, uh, teachers, uh, artists, uh, mm -hmm. uh, just incredible people, you know, who are just there. We have fun with each other, you know, and it's a good, good group. You know, it's one of those communities that you, yeah. you have that you yeah. look forward to spending a little time with. Yeah, I have people that I spend an afternoon yeah. or an evening a month with. Yeah. Do you know that one up to between 16 and 30 percent of the population are now nons. Nons? Yeah, not nuns, but nons, non-affiliated, meaning do not choose to affiliate with any organized religious, but instead have community of folks that they spend time with oh, because oh, okay. they find it's more fulfilling. That's just the statistics in the United States. And this is one of my communities, you know, of people. That oh, yeah. I look, yeah. And, and other people, it's a yoga group. Other people, it's mm -hmm. people, they just book clubs, whatever, you know, and usually they talk about the book for five minutes and spend the time just community, you know, just with other people of like mind who they talk about life and whatever else, and they're very comfortable with that. And I think it's a, it's a, a message to organized religion, which has had a, tough go lately uh, based on all the things that have been in the news mm -hmm. that they have to kind of start looking at why people are wandering away from these. Well, you know, sometimes um, the particular religion that uh, or denomination or mm. whatever that people are um, have always been affiliated yeah. with um, somehow they, if they have a chance to get introduced to something else. something else, and they realize that that is more of them, of more course. them than, uh, uh, than, you know, being like a Christian or whatever. Of course. And, yeah, and um, well, you know, I, um, discovered yoga when I was 25 and years this is, old. I know, I've got a daughter who, who has got a whole community of yoga people and I, very interesting, she's moved from that. Uh, she's uh, from a, a family of mixed religious backgrounds mm -hmm. and uh, she went to Israel on, on what's called the Taglet. One of her parents, me, is Jewish. And, oh, I didn't and, know that. And she, <laughs> and she um, so she went to Israel. We, we don't, my wife's brought up as a Catholic, though she's not a practicing Catholic mm -hmm. anymore. And all our kids, we ex expose them to everything. 
Mm-hmm. You know, just every holiday, they, you know, when it's Passover, they know what that is. When it's Easter, they know what's that. When it's Christmas, they know what's that. It's just to show them what all the different mm-hmm. beliefs are. And she went there with a group of people and has become quite spiritual mm-hmm. uh, with a whole group of people in Denver who are of, of the Jewish faith, but it's much more a spiritual thing, which is quite amazing because she went from a yoga group to this. Mm-hmm. and. It's it's just interesting, and you're right. People find what is most comfortable for them, and right. there's no one right. way. I mean, right. whatever way you choose, it's your own. Whatever makes you comfortable in the world is what counts. Uh, I think um, what we're seeing is that each of the religious groups has their fanatics at one end or the other, and somewhere in the middle is some common ground of a belief in something and, and you've got to find that and be comfortable with it. And, and, and it's not my business to tell you what to do about no, it. And, no, no, Or you're, not. tell me, no. I, I've got to find my way and you find your way. Right, and right. It's, and as long as the ultimate thing is we treat each other well and mm-hmm. we, 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 you know, you can get up in the morning and feel good about how you're mm-hmm. carrying on your life. I, I think that's the important thing. Well, but, you know, mm. um, getting into yoga because I felt it was it sounded like something that I really mm-hmm. needed, but I that led me to being able to um, go and spend time in an ashram mm-hmm. with swamis and, mm-hmm. and Brahmin priests. Mm-hmm. And you know that getting involved in that felt like coming home for the first time. I, but this is what <laughs> you know. I, I think I, I, used, I have a lot of friends in, from a previous lifetime in Canada who went and did the same thing. And they came back with Indian names and a whole thing, you know. And again, it, it's whatever mm-hmm. gives you the peace and the, mm-hmm. and also uh, some um, understanding of where we all are in the world, you know. Mm-hmm. So um, where we are at the moment is we have 5% of the world's population using over 50% of the world's opiate, mm-hmm. okay, in this country. So mm-hmm. we've approached it, the war on drugs. Mm-hmm. And we've had that going on for, mm-hmm. since Nancy Reagan, the war, just say no, the war on drugs, and before that. Mm-hmm. At that time, most of the drug use was in marginalized population. Now we're seeing drug use at every level, everywhere, everywhere. And the drugs that are being used now are lethal, oh. some of them. Yeah. Oh, yeah and we have, we have, for the first time in half a century, a decline in our you know, longevity. Mm-hmm. We're looking at our exp- life expectancy in this country has dropped. Mm-hmm. And the reason it has dropped is you have this group of 100,000 individuals dying. Forget COVID, because that was a whole other story. This is 100,000 individuals who are between 20 and 40, 50 years of age. Well, the way you calculate life expectancy, which is very interesting, you have a life expectancy, you know, whatever it is, but a, 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 a one-year-old has 80 or 90 years of life expectancy. Mm -hmm. If you take a 20 year old, they still have 60 years of life expectancy. If you snap that out of them, 100,000 of them out every year, the the data just changes because that's a huge um, loss of years of productive life, YPLL, okay? That is what has the, an 80 year old dies, it doesn't affect life expectancy. Maybe they should have lived 85 or whatever else. A 20 year old dies, that's 60 years of potential life gone. And so when you do the- At ex- least. Yes, I, I'm just saying, when you do the expectancy table statistically, that cohort of individuals dying every year pff, changes the life expectancy dramatically. And that's what we're seeing. Mm-hmm. now. So my first point was 5% of the world's population is using a disproportionate amount of the world's opiates. So the problem that we've approached it as is that, well, these bad guys are bringing in all this stuff. We gotta stop them and we've tried every way possible. They fly it in, they bring it in by submarine, they do this, they did that, that. 
because they're businessmen. They got a market. They're selling stuff to people who are using it. Mm -hmm. so, and they don't, they don't care if the people well, who are using it die. Well, they do in a sense because you're losing a customer. Oh, okay. But these are really bad people. Mm -hmm. But they're just businessmen. And we keep approaching this as a supply problem. Mm -hmm. That if we stop this stuff from coming in, it's going to stop. It's a demand problem. And we've never approached it as a demand problem. Because we, if, if people are going to keep using, buying it... Then they will find a way to bring it in. Yeah. So yeah. there's that problem. And the countries that have looked at it as a demand issue and as an illness, not as a criminal... Okay, there's criminality in the people bringing the drugs and mm -hmm. people selling it. That's criminal. Mm -hmm. But they're businessmen. And they're satisfying a demand. If we stop the demand, what happens to the businessmen? Well, right now, what the businessmen are doing is one other thing which enters the whole political story. We got our southern border. It's just masses of people fleeing the mess that's in Central and South America because of gangs and whatever else. And you hear on the news, ah, they're, they're emptying the, the latest. They're emptying their prisons and their mental... That's all nonsense. These are people leaving terrible situations where mm -hmm. the murder rates and the, 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 uh, you know, the human trafficking and the violence in uh, Ecuador, uh, you, know, you name the place, Colombia, uh, Central, all Central and South America, Mexico, all these places, it's just awful. And so what are these people doing? They're leaving, you'd leave too. You'd get your kids out of there. So what's the border? The border is jammed with people who want to get away from that and we're causing it by our demand here. Oh. You see, so we okay. are the cause of some of that problem. Okay. Now, obviously, some of the people are leaving because they think they can get a better life here. And yeah, some of them are probably bad people. The majority are women and kids. And they're coming because they don't want to be part of what's going on there anymore. Mm -hmm. And we're causing it by demanding and the, gr the, the, the crops of uh, you know, cocaine and, and whatever else they're selling. Um, so we've got to stop. Yeah. Got to stop the demand, which we... Our, our attempt has been to imprison people, to, uh, you know, the, the treatment programs are very, very, uh, you know, limited. Um, most of these people are treated uh, second-class citizens. They go to crime, prostitution, whatever else. And um, the countries that have had a much better record on this, Portugal, has cut their deaths by, by you know, 50 percent. What they do, they created it as a, a medical problem. Mm -hmm. And they approach these people as sick. Mm -hmm. And they, um, they, you know, everybody has this idea that drug users are out there just shooting up and nodding off and having a great time. The majority of drug users are just looking for some way not to go into withdrawal. If you stop using an opiate within a certain number of hours, that opiate center in your brain receptor is screaming for more opiate and you start to get nauseated, the shakes, then you have to use more opiate. And so they're sick. Mm -hmm. And they have unfortunately trained their brains, probably permanently, to be opiate dependent. Mm -hmm. And um, the best programs that work are the programs that do uh, risk reduction and also substitute. Methadone is one substitute, Subutex or Suboxone is the other. They're very effective. Um, and so if you were a diabetic, I'd be giving you, let's say you were an insulin de dependent diabetic, I'd be giving you insulin. Mm -hmm. If you stop using insulin, you have a problem. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're an opiate addict, if you stop using opiate, you have a problem. Mm -hmm. And so our, our best approach is not to throw them in jail, but to put them into programs where we replace what they're getting on the street with safe, managed programs. Obviously, counseling, um, provide them with health services, all the social fabric which is gone by the time you get to them when they're in jail because they've stolen from everybody in their family and all their friends and they've gotten into trouble and they've, you know, prostitution and the whole business, which can help. They're desperate to continue not going into withdrawal. Now, yeah. 
that's, so that, that's the issue for us. And it's a terrible problem because it ruins families and ruins individuals. And where it used to be 40 years ago, 50 years ago, in the poorer segments of the population, it's now everywhere. You see children of very, very well-to-do families dying, children of, of families of means, uh, middle class, upper class, it doesn't matter. And unless we get our heads around this, we we'll continue to have the problem. We have to address that it's an illness and it's a chronic relapsing illness, mm -hmm. much like alcohol. alcohol yeah. So uh, the program with alcohol, which has worked, is not to throw these people in jail, but to get them into counseling, get them into AA. Uh, you have to get them onto medications that stop their craving. Uh, and it's a lifelong support system, Cr many, many failures. Uh, same thing with cigarette smoking. Cigarettes, oh, cigarettes kill yeah. 420,000 Americans every year. Yeah. 420,000. Uh, a third of them die of lung cancer, a third of them die of emphysema, a third of them die of early heart disease. Yeah. Um, you know, I've seen ads on television, anti-smoking type mm -hmm. of ads over the years. And uh, they have even, uh, some people have said uh, that their smoking habit has led to things like actually losing legs. Oh, of course, and, of course, and because like it that. causes vasoconstriction. And in people who already have some arterial narrowing when you smoke a cigarette, it causes even more. And ultimately, yes, you can, it, it causes arteriosclerotic disease and early heart attacks are one thing smokers get. Mm -hmm. um, and nationwide, there's been a, a rather good program using a risk reduction model for smoking. So we're down to about 16% of the population smokes. In Chautauqua County, it's over 20, 20 something percent. It's just still, uh, mm -hmm. a, a very difficult problem. And now you've got vaping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so this is an industry that is just morphing to continue to sell their right. product. Right. Now, that was one thing I wanted you to, to ask you uh, so that the viewing audience um, could hear. Now, I have heard young people saying they had been smoking and then they switched to vaping because they didn't feel that it, that they felt that it was safer than smoking. But from my point of view, it's probably just as bad, isn't it? Well, it's hard to say because we have a much longer view on smoking than we do on vaping. Mm -hmm. uh, 1961 or 62, the Surgeon General's report came in on smoking because they had data Mm -hmm. uh, and the data are, are just ongoing of 420,000 Americans die every year because they smoke. Mm -hmm. uh, vaping, we just don't have that long view. Mm -hmm. We know, and, and, and cigarette smoking, of course, the, you have not only the hot tars and nicotine going in, the nicotine being the addictive substance, right. which causes constriction of arteries, and, but it's the hot tars and all the other chemicals in cigarettes that are, are the problem that give you the emphysema and heart, heart disease, lung disease, lung cancer. Vaping, you know, of course, they, the product is slightly different, um, but it's thought to be a gateway to smoking, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and of course, you're still breathing in something into your lungs, those beautiful right. lungs that you right. were given when you right. were born that just do such a, you know, if people don't realize the work that that lung is doing for you. Well, you know? you know, I don't know if it's not common knowledge or what, but it's my understanding that in the lungs and the esophagus, there's hairs called mm -hmm. cilia. Cilia, yeah. And it, uh, smoking burns away the well, cilia. Well, remember, you're breathing in very hot uh, yeah. you know, tar and nicotine and all kinds of 5,000 different chemicals in the cigarettes. Yeah. Um, it, basically what finally happens with smokers is, uh, and let's leave lung cancer aside because that's a, another story, but their elastic tissue in their lungs starts to deteriorate. And so their lungs 
get bigger, but can't, when you breathe, breathing is a very interesting phenomenon. Mm -hmm. You exhale without any effort mm -hmm. because the elastic tissue in your lung does it for you. Mm -hmm. You inhale by dropping your diaphragm. So a smoker has able to drop their diaphragm and get air in, but they, have, they can't get the air out, so they trap a lot of air. And oh. people with emphysema have bigger chests, and they can't move air either way because they, they don't have the elastic tissue anymore. So they've damaged their lung tissue, and you look at the x-ray of a, someone with emphysema, the lungs are like, uh, and there's not much air moving. So yeah. uh, there's a lot of damage that goes on, fibrosis and um, well, I was just going I was just going to mention that I knew somebody that I knew uh, died of pulmonary fibrosis. Yeah, that's a different condition. Is that? Yeah, that's a, a weird condition where people, their lungs become fibrotic and inelastic, and uh, uh, they just. It's very. I, it's interesting because when I have medical students with me, and I have a patient with pulmonary fibrosis, I have them listen because it sounds just the same as someone who's in heart failure, you hear in heart failure, you hear rowls, except these rowls sound like Rice Krispies when you pour milk on Rice Krispies, oh. snap, crackle, and pop. Wow. It is a, it's like saran wrap, and that's the sound you hear in there. And they, they, yeah, that's a terrible disease. The only treatment is lung transplant for pulmonary fibrosis. So oh. It's a bad disease. Oh, yeah. But it's not the same as emphysema. Emphysema is a, a, a purely a cigarette-related or mm. a, um, other people, yeah, I mean, there are other conditions which can give you emphysema, silophilers disease, farmer's lung, there are a bunch of other ones. Black uh, lung? Anyway, mm -hmm. it's, but tobacco is the major mm -hmm. issue. And that people are still allowed to smoke today, that this stuff is allowed to be sold when it's killing so many people. Mm -hmm. is totally unbelievable. Mm -hmm. But that's mm -hmm. another story for another day. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I wanted to bring up, well, uh, we're on smoking. Ooh. stuff. Um, I wanted to bring up, um, nowadays, nowadays you're hearing they're working towards making recreational marijuana legal and mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, but then again, uh, you're inhaling stuff into your lungs mm -hmm. that is not oxygen. And basically, oxygen is the only thing we're supposed to be able, be able to breathe. Or should be breathing. Should be breathing yes. into our lungs. Yeah. And, uh, but there was one thing that I heard on the radio a year or two ago that struck me funny. Um, there's this, tele or not television, radio program on the radio on the weekend. It's a Dr. Zorba Pastor. Have you ever heard oh, of I, I know Zorba Pastor. I yeah. listen to him all the time. Well, okay, so for those of you in the viewing audience uh, who don't know, it's uh, one of those radio programs where you can call in and ask questions. Mm -hmm. And one time when I was listening, um, this guy called up, mm -hmm. and uh, he said uh, he wasn't smoking pot. What happened was... On his lunch break from work one day, he drove over to his mother's house to um, get something to eat, I guess mm -hmm. it was, and he gets there and her, his mother's not at home. But he notices she's baked a batch of brownies. Mm, and so he had a, he had and, a brownie, okay. Well, okay, I guess he had a whole bunch of them. Yeah, he which, was hungry and oh, ate a whole bunch of them. And he had some hash so, brownies or some, uh, yeah. Yeah, so anyway, he's on his way driving back to work when he starts to feel really, really sick. Yeah. And he pulls, he gets to where there's a gas station and he pulls in there and passes out. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, when he came to, he was in a hospital, hmm. and uh, and uh, that was so. Anyway, they had done but some while he was unconscious. They, they done, did some talk screening on him and found yeah, that he had they uh, found uh, cannabis. Out that yeah. he had sure. a huge amount of yeah. <laughs> THC. But you know that um, but, um, uh, THC has been. Um, used medically for a long time. Uh, they're, they're, Marinol is a drug that's THC, used as an appetite stimulant, was used in early uh, in the AIDS epidemic when they were wasting disease. Oh, oh yeah. But also in, in people who, 
uh, you need to stimulate their appetite because they have some form of uh, you know, uh, abnormal weight loss. It, it, it's an excellent drug used in the right way, like anything else. It's, um, you know, sitting around smoking it, unfortunately what we've seen, one of the real problems with it is in the younger people. Um, vaping it or smoking it before they have developed a full sense of mature brain, you know, a mature oh, a reality. Oh, yeah. And you see these lost souls who never, never go through that part of life which we've all gone through where you, you're, you know, you make mistakes, you, you, you know, you fall down, you get up, you're doing it, you know, growing up as whatever, until you're about 25, you're, you're, you know, you mm -hmm. just, you're learning. Some people just never get there because they started um, at age 10 smoking and it changes your brain. This is all brain chemistry. And um, the difference between you smoking, you know, some, some marijuana and a 12 year old is, is enormous because of your concrete sense of reality and everything else. There's just, now I'm not saying you should or shouldn't, but the use of a THC um, in gummies for sleep, people who can't sleep. Oh, um, yeah. The use for people who have uh, cancer, who need uh, appetite stimulant. I mean, there are uses. These drugs have been around for a long, long, long time. Unfortunately, like anything else, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's thought to be a gateway drug for young people to start and then move on to other things. And probably, um, you know, we have to be very careful with these things. And now you're finding they're all laced with uh, cocaine and fentanyl and all that. Uh, and this is a whole other story. Um, really dangerous street drugs are, are now extremely dangerous. Mm -hmm. What amazes me is that, because you brought this up, how can someone be selling drugs to people knowing that it's going to kill them? You're killing your, your clients. Mm -hmm. And this was happening with fentanyl. The fentanyl overdoses are brutal mm -hmm. and they're lethal. It is an um, incredibly lethal substance. Now, it's used all the time in the operating room um, for conscious sedation, uh, for colonoscopies. I mean, all these, you know, people use a little bit of fentanyl uh, in, in the in surgery all the time as mm -hmm. part of the sedation uh, for people who are undergoing surgery. That's totally different from what you're finding here. The stuff that's in, you know, what's out there on the street is lethal. And the overdoses are, le and we use Narcan on these people and you have to use dose after dose after dose because it's so potent. Uh, it's amazing. You know, um, I've noticed uh, when we're traveling on a through a type mm -hmm. of road so when you have to go to the bathroom or something you go to a rest mm -hmm. stop and i have been noticing in the public restrooms now you will see a white metal box and in red lettering it, um, on the box it will say that narcan supplies are in the in yeah. the box yeah. so yeah. i mean are people driving their cars oh, of course they, while of course, of course while they they're are. of course they are they're taking an of overdose of a drug well they don't know it's an overdose you know uh, so. you know when you're you buy some marijuana on the street you don't know what's in it mm -hmm. um anyway it, it, it's it, it the problem is so large that we can't I mean, we have to get our heads around this because it is just sapping the, the, the lifeblood out of this country. So I'm going to ask you a question because you've been asking me questions. Okay. Did you ever buy an Edsel? No. <laughs> you know what an Edsel was? A, a car? Yes, it was a car produced by Ford. Uh-huh. It was an amazing car at the time. They made 250,000 of them. Mm -hmm. No one bought them. So what did oh they do? Gosh. So what did they do? Quit making them. Exactly, because there was no demand. Mm -hmm. There's the lesson. Okay. If so you what? have no demand, the supply goes away. Now everybody thinks there are guys on the street corner enticing our kids to try this and blah blah. blah. Yeah, sure, but the supply goes away if there's no demand. Mm -hmm. And the Edsel went 
the way of the dodo mm -hmm. bird. You know, it's gone, it's extinct, mm -hmm. it didn't, because no one bought it. Mm -hmm. Well, we got to figure out a way to stop people from buying it here and the supply will go away. Yeah. Now, that's a very simplistic way of looking at supply and demand. Well, a, lot, a lot of people do things because of peer pressure. I, I understand all that. This is all a question of education and of support and of treating this as an illness and going after everybody who's using and trying to help them get off the, they're on a merry-go-round. They have to keep using because they're going into withdrawal. Withdrawal, you don't die from withdrawal. You just wish you would die, it's so bad. Alcohol, if you go into alcohol withdrawal, 15% of people die with it. It's, it's a lethal, but with most pure heroin, the, the, the withdrawal is just awful. So people just keep buying it and then they run out of money, and then they steal, and they, yeah, yeah, it goes on and on and on. So we have to stop that, mm -hmm. because that's the way to stop this. Mm -hmm. And it's a big problem. It's mm -hmm. not that easy. Mm -hmm. uh, you need programs, you need um, r you know, risk reduction. You need, I mean, in, our, in my office, I have, we, 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 we uh, prescribe Suboxone. I have 60 or 70 patients who come in, no one knows who they are, they come in, maybe it's a sore throat, you don't know, and they come in, they get their prescription for Suboxone for years. I've got people who are taking it every, every day. Wow. And it just stops any withdrawal, any jitter. They go to work, they have a business, they have whatever they do. That's their own business. Do you mean that this particular medication that you prescribe, if they, they can take it, if they start to feel withdrawal symptoms? Well, it stops the withdrawal. It does. And they used to take it regularly and we keep tapering the dose, but some of them are on a minuscule dose for the rest of their life because they've trained their brain that this is what they need. Well, if you're a diabetic, I'm not gonna at some point just stop your, your insulin, you need it. Mm -hmm. And we may have to approach these people with the idea that they have to be on these medications for a lifetime, which is no big deal. They're, they're very effective. Mm -hmm. uh, they keep people in the workforce. They keep moms with their kids. Um, it's totally amazing when you have someone who realizes that their life has changed, that they're no longer out on the street chasing after drugs, you know, because they are going to go into withdrawal if they don't have them. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's my take on it. Mm -hmm. um, cigarettes are a whole other story. They're tough. They're, that's a tough addiction to stop. We have, you know, all kinds of prescriptions and everything else. and. The number of people who start and fail and fail back, it is really like they say seven times before you get someone to quit. The drug that's most worrisome aside from fentanyl is methamphetamine. Oh. It's, it's speed, yeah. you know. It's really easy to make. People are cooking it in their homes, you know, yeah. blowing their homes up from time to time. And there's no, there's no medication to, you know, it, it, it's, a drug which we don't know what to do with. Mm -hmm. these, and these people are dangerous. It, it, um, the first case I ever saw, and this is a long, long, long time ago, was a kid who we thought had schizophrenia. And oh. it wasn't, it was methamphetamine-induced oh. wow. psychosis. It makes people crazy, Wow! absolutely crazy. And they don't sleep for days on end, and their skin is bad, teeth fall out, and really, and, they're, they're, and they're, they can be very dangerous it, because they start to hallucinate. It, it's really a bad drug. And, you know, most heroin, uh, they just nod off, go to sleep, whatever. Else. You know, that, this is not that. This mm -hmm. is a really dangerous drug. And there's a lot of it around, a lot of people making it, selling it um, locally, everywhere. And there's no treatment. There's nothing you can do with these people. I mean, you, yeah, you can stop them using it, but there's no model to deal with them except abstinence, and that's really hard because they get, they are really feeling like they're, you know, on top of the world with this stuff. It's really, really, mm. Mm, yeah, mm. It's, it's you, you, know, you go days on end like you're wired for sound, you know, ready to go, all, and it's really bad stuff. Mm -hmm. um, heart disease with it, um, yeah, yeah, um, tough, 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 yeah. tough, tough. Well, um, moving along to the mm. alcoholic beverages, mm -hmm. now, 
When I was young and first old enough to drink, um, well, 18 was the legal drinking age right. in New York State right. when I was 18 years right. old. But um, I only drank alcoholic beverages for a few years when I was first old enough, and I quit because I didn't like the way it made me feel, that, and it didn't taste good. So, And that, that's fine. Um, For most people, that's what happens. You know, a lot, I've had a lot of other people tell me that they didn't, dr haven't drank most of their adult lives. Or people because have a drink, you know, with a glass of wine or something, like with dinner, for sure. The problem is there is a, a genetic predisposition. If you have a family member, especially a mother or father who is an alcoholic, mm -hmm. um, you gen probably are programmed either from environmentally watching them, pardon me, drink, or genetically you are very sensitive to the effects of alcohol. Yeah, it, it is a, a, a serious problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, it can be just ruin people's lives. And it's, it can kill people. I, mm -hmm. I, it's effect on the liver and the brain oh, is, yeah. oh yeah. yeah. So you have a, people with cirrhosis, people with alcoholic dementias, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, the other issues, uh, the... Um, Having accidents uh, yes, because the, you were driving Well, of course, the, the, what alcohol does in the brain, it's a disinhibitor. And so the word no goes away. Uh, all those things that you had learned about not doing suddenly don't become so you know onerous, and you take risks, and and it, it, it's just what alcohol does in your brain. It works by, you know, people do foolish things. Why do they do foolish things? Because their inhibitions are gone. How it works in doing that is is rather interesting, but that's why people drive when they're drunk, and they should. You, you you know you shouldn't be driving when you're tired, when you're you've had a drink, when you're. Uh, you know, you, you, uh, other things, you know, but you do it anyway because you don't think y y you've lost all re the reasons to go away and the, the inhibition goes away. It's, it's a potent disinhibitor and so people do foolish things mm -hmm. and they get into trouble. And then you have, of course, the suicides, the firearms, the, you know, all the, the things that go on when... And the mass shootings? Well, I, but the mass shootings aren't caused by alcohol. It's usually suicide. Is uh, that is that usually a mental the mass shootings problem? Uh, I mean, the mass shootings are very interesting. The the data first of all, this country has mass shootings like nowhere else in the world. Right. So it has to do with firearms, but uh, that's a whole other issue. But it also has to do with um, uh, folks who just have a view of the world and what's going on and the, 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 uh, what they feel is right and wrong with the, the way they've been treated or what else is going on. A lot of workplace shootings uh, because of disgruntled folks um, and a lot of suicides. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very efficient means of suicide and because uh, it, uh, it usually works. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, it's it's, 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 it's an issue. I don't, uh, alcohol uh, and also parties and people get shot at parties and, and again it's disinhibiting and people have, why well, you bring a gun to a party is another story but uh, have a few drinks and then it becomes quite a different story. Um, and so it, it, it's a problem. Um, and I think actually the nation as a whole has done a better job with alcohol than, you know, a lot of work has gone into dealing with uh, AA is still a very effective way of dealing with it. It's a group community approach to, um, you know, providing not only the alcoholic but the families of alcoholics and everything support. It, it works. It's a very, very interesting problem. But um, right at the moment, drugs are, are the major issue, you know, mm -hmm. in this country. Major cause of crime, petty crime, um, major cause of uh, early death, um, and also of 
dysfunctional young people just not not able to carry you know have a job show up then don't show up show up late you know uh, half the guys working out there on certain jobs are probably not exactly um, sober oh. either not from alcohol but from you know Lots of things. Lots, Lots of, things. of things. And, and, and so workplace accidents or absenteeism or um, just lack of attendance. You talk to everybody these days. They can't get people to show up to work. Um, one third of the people showing up for a job can't, can't pee in a bottle without it showing something in there that shouldn't be there. What, what's going on? What's the, what's the discontent? What's the problem? Um, I don't know. It's 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 an interesting issue, mm -hmm. um, but as a nation, we have to come to grips with it. We can't continue to approach it in a puritanical sense of these are bad people. These aren't. These are sons and daughters, mothers and fathers, who have a medical problem. Maybe it began because they broke their ankle and started taking opiates and couldn't stop. Even after the pain was gone, they just were addicted. Uh, that's a certain percentage of the population. Yeah. And the blame game for doctors prescribing and, and all the oxycontin, you know, that whole thing. Yeah, uh, we were taught that pain was the fifth, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, essential, uh, you know, you look at uh, the vital signs and pain was a vital sign and we had to make sure people weren't in pain. Um, and then, oh, these drugs don't, yeah, they're very safe. Well, they weren't safe, they're very addictive. And yes, yeah, so there's a certain segment of the population that got hooked with that. But there's also this other whole other issue going on out there, you know. Uh, people just, a whole subculture using drugs and, uh, uh, you know, same person getting Narcan four or five or six times by the police who find them overdosed. <sighs> tough, tough world. Mm -hmm. And I am... Um, well, you know, there, um, there are some other things that I tried to do when I was young but couldn't continue with them just because, uh, well, apparently I'm sensitive to certain things, not just the alcohol, but caffeine. I can't, I can't handle caffeine, so I've... N uh, most of my life I have not been a coffee drinker just because it makes me so nervous and would make me so nervous and anxious. And but that, that's, that's okay. That's, mm -hmm. I can drink a cup of coffee before I go to bed. It doesn't do anything for me. I, I, it's, it's we're it's all <laughs> different and it's okay. And what you have to do and part of growing up in this world is knowing what works for you. Mm -hmm. As you said, you, you went and did yoga and found a whole different part of you. A whole that, different yes. way of life. Yes. Well, yeah. I, I, I go out for a bike ride or a run and I'm lost for a while just in another world in my head, you know, of just a place which is peaceful and quiet and I can sort out things that I haven't been able to sort out because the distractions are gone. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I can remember there was a Facebook comment by a patient of mine. Yeah, he just wants me to go to physical therapy. He thinks that, you know, he's just an exercise freak. I'm not an exercise freak, he just makes me feel good. And mm -hmm. physical therapy is a wonderful way of finding ways to Help yourself. To help yourself. <laughs> yeah. And it's not yeah. just pain meds and drugs and everything else. There's a certain amount of work that goes into looking after yourself. Well, you know, it's a funny thing about the caffeine. Um, some friends of ours gave us one of those big, I think, those big chocolate bars, you know. Yeah. Uh, they're going. It, it was a gift. It was mm -hmm. part of a Christmas present from them. and. Um, <laughs> they go, oh, it's really good for your health. Well, my husband and I um, sat down to lunch one day, and uh, he, he kind of wanted to eat a little bit of this chocolate mm. bar. And this is at lunchtime, mind you. Mm -hmm. um, 
<laughs> this was not in the evening or anything like that. And you that. couldn't sleep that night? Not um, Because there's caffeine in it. They make they, it was 92%. Well, they do that use... That was 92% they, cacao. Well, they do... They and all I had was I two know, little but they tiny do, squares. They do use some caffeine. I mean, at least some, some chocolates <laughs> do that. Um, <laughs> but again, life is not as simple as we think. It's actually, I'm reading a fascinating book well, at the moment uh, yeah, you, uh, about you life. You have to figure yeah. these things mm. out on your own. But, uh, but what I, was it? Um, I'm reading a book. Let me just tell you about this book I'm reading. Okay. okay? Um, you, know, you know about Darwin, okay? Yeah. I was just in Australia, and, and, and Darwin, I, I told you I saw this plaque that mm -hmm. Darwin mm -hmm. had been there. Mm -hmm. Well, Darwin came up with this theory of, you know, uh, that um, it's selection of the fittest, and, and these, these traits are passed on. And, and then... That's been common thinking for quite a while. And Mendel, the, the, the monk, did Mendelian genetics in your share, you know, and, and the different... Well, I'm reading this book, uh, David Anuman, I think his name is, and it's about, it's called The Tree of Life, okay? The Tangle Tree, sorry. The oh, Tangle, the tangle tree. tree. Yeah. And people started to look at this and say, wait a minute, there's more to this than we think. And then there were people who were splitting RNA and looking at it and DNA and looking at Do you realize your mitochondria, which are the little work engines in your cells, originally came from bacteria and somehow got into our cells and our, however long ago, and now our cells use these little work engines to produce energy. And chlorophyll got put into plants somehow, you know, and, it, and they've looked at the DNA of these little organs in, that we use in our cells, and they come from other places. And it's this whole very complex arrangement that isn't so simple as your mother and father, and, 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 and the genetics and the survival of the fittest and everything else, that we have adapted to this world by borrowing. And do you realize that in your gut, you have billions of bacteria? Mm -hmm. And they are sharing information between them, not only by splitting, like you, we would, but by passing it through their cell walls. Uh, you know, and, 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 and that's how we're getting all this drug resistance, because they're giving this information to each other. And there's a whole much more complex process going on than we think than just what Darwin said, though he started the game you know, of us thinking about this. But it's fascinating. And so, yes, you can't tolerate caffeine. And I could, it doesn't bother me at all. Hmm. And you could probably, if you broke your leg, take an opiate because you had pain. I broke my arm, I fell off my barn roof. I shattered it, it was uh, 1998. One hydrocodone, five milligrams at bedtime would stop it buzzing. After, after about uh, two, three weeks, if I needed it, I would take, that's it, I'm done. Mm -hmm. Other people, it's all they need to take, and they're on the, the mm -hmm. merry-go-round. Why are they on the merry-go-round? Who knows? And it's not just the bad people, it's just some genetic, it, you know, alter. And so it's a very complex issue that we're dealing with. And you brought up caffeine, but it's the same thing with opiates. There are people who take them because they have pain. And then when the pain goes away, they stop. You know, they did a study of mm -hmm. Vietnam veterans who were addicted, in quotes, to heroin in, 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 in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. They got off the plane, never used again. Mm. Well, they were in a terrible situation there. Oh, they Horrible sure Horrible situation. Yeah. And so they would use it just to, to numb themselves. But they came back to normal life and that was it. But now some of them were addicted when they came home. But a lot of them weren't. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not that simple uh, an issue. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 individuals are extremely complex. And, what, and it's a complex of nature and nurture and how you were brought up. And even brought up in the best of homes, you get addicts. And you get in the worst of homes, you don't get addicts. Mm -hmm. And people whose both parents are addicts and they don't, you know. And other people, the whole, everybody in the family is addicted. It is very, very strange how this all works. The same thing with alcoholics. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing. You'll get a family where the father's an alcoholic, the son becomes an alcoholic, the doctors could care less.
-hmm. and, and we don't know how this all works, but it's very, very complex. But it, it's, um, but we got to stop approaching addiction as a criminal process. Now there's some criminality involved, of course, but a lot of the criminality is being driven by people in desperation mm -hmm. and they're desperately sick and we have to fix that. Yeah, um, uh, a lot, they, I, I'm not sure they're doing it so much anymore, but um, it used to be that people were, that were addicted to stuff would get arrested and thrown in jail. They still are. And what they really need is help. Right. And you, now the jails know? are starting to do medically assisted treatment. Oh, are they? Yes. The problem is as soon as someone leaves jail, how do you follow them up and keep them in the system? Otherwise, they just come back. So you have to keep them in counseling and in treatment and whatever else. And, and that's the hard part. Uh, you can't get a phone number. They're gone, you know. Uh, the, that's, yes, and, and uh, the same thing with mental illness. Our jails are the largest, some of the largest repositories. The largest mental institution in the United States is Los Angeles Cook County Jail. Oh my gosh. And it's a, it, it, these people shouldn't be in jail. No. It, it, some of the crimes they commit are, are just because they're sick. Mm -hmm. And we just have failed mm -hmm. with respect to the treatment of mental health. We're great at transplanting organs. At a million yes. dollars, at a million dollars, you know. Yeah. But we we don't have enough money to 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 treat the mentally ill, and they're hard to treat. It, it's a difficult process. Ten percent of our population needs mental health treatment, and and counseling, and and whatever else. And we've just gotten into the habit of writing prescriptions for them, and it's much more complex than that. And and they're poly. I, 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 these are people who have substance abuse, have, have mental health illnesses, maybe alcoholic as well, and, and have all kinds of other physical ailments, and they need to be treated as a, you know, in, in a holistic way. And we're not, we're not yet doing it. And the reason we're not doing it is because the, the healthcare system is broken. I mean, it's a, it's an insurance run. Uh, oh, it's an insurance run scam. Yeah. Yeah. Awful. Unfortunately. Awful. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, people talk about, well, we don't want socialized medicine, you know, blah, blah. we already have the VA system, Medicare, Medicaid, which are running a lot better than the insurance side of things. The insurance side of things, are, it's just business and denying care, or making it very expensive for me to run an office. I have people just shuffling paper to deal with the insurers. Yeah, it, this is not good. Uh, and we could do an awful lot better. We're spending a trillion dollars on health care in this country, which is twice as much as any other country in the world spending per capita. And you know what our results are? We're 19th in the world in infant mortality, which happens to be the most sensitive indicator of how well you're doing. And we're 19th behind Croatia. I mean, give me a break. 19th when we're spending twice as much as anywhere else. If you run a business where you were 19th in your, amongst your competitors, spending twice as much, you'd be out of business. Yeah. And so, well, what are we doing wrong? Well, we've decided to let the insurance industry run our healthcare as a business, and it's not doing well. No. And no. so, they're making it more expensive and making, putting more barriers up to, to healthcare. Oh, you gotta wait in line in Canada. Uh, their numbers there are better than ours. So waiting in line isn't the issue. It's they spend half as much as we do and have better results. It, wait a minute, same thing in Germany, same thing in France. Now, are they perfect? No, they have their own problems. But for the average Joe or Jane, it is a better deal. Mm -hmm. Here, you talk to people, they're going, this is the only country in the world you can go bankrupt if you have an illness. Right. Bankrupt. That's yeah. craziness. How can you go bankrupt? Healthcare is a right, not a privilege. It is your right as a human being to have good health care in this country and not spend twice as much as everywhere else in the world and be 19th in the world in the quality indicator. That makes no sense. And yet we're accepting that. And uh, oh, it, it, it's tragic. It, it is tragic. Uh, 
Yeah. The healthcare industry under Obamacare was forced to go from taking 30% of every dollar for their own profit administration down to 20%, mm -hmm. okay? The rest of the world's working at nine and a half to 10%. Mm -hmm. We're working at 20%, meaning 10% more than of our cost is going somewhere other than which called medical loss. You are a medical loss, okay? 80% mm -hmm. of money goes to medical loss, which means payment for your care. Everywhere else, they're spending 90 cents on the dollar for that and getting better results. Mm -hmm. We are spending an extra 10% to satisfy the insurer's shareholders and functioning at 19th in the world. That's a real marvelous business approach. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it makes no sense, but we keep doing it and your healthcare costs keep going up, keep going up, and, uh, uh, and they talk about rationing in Canada and in Germany and everything else. Come to see me and get an MRI, okay? Uh, no, you don't get an MRI. I have to first call somewhere in Tennessee to talk to someone. To get who, permission. To, to, you know, to give my firstborn child and to uh, whatever else I have to do to beg to get permission for you to get an MRI. Well, we don't think they qualify. We don't, I, they in Tennessee don't think that my opinion that you need an MRI allows you to qualify. That's rationing. And it's all about mm -hmm. that. Well, the, the problem with that is um, people are paying a lot of money for their insurance. Oh, I, I, I know they are. That's <laughs> just what I'm saying. Yes. They're paying twice as much as what they should. Uh -huh. And also, people are now self, they're not self-insuring. They're, what do they call it? Um, they're, they're um, oh, there's a term for it. It's lost my, I, where you, um, you, you, you take a, a smaller, you pay a smaller premium, but you self-insure for the first 10,000 or something like that, right? That, that's a whole, well. A high deductible? A high deductible plan. Oh, thank you. It's a high, oh my gosh. yeah, thank you. A high deductible plan. A high deductible plan <laughs> is just, you're assuming more risk. Uh huh. And so now people are not paying as much premium, but when they go for care, the first 10,000 is on them. Wow. So what's happening though is, let's say your premium was, $500 a month. Mm -hmm. So now it's $250 a month. Do you think you take that 250 that you saved and put it in a piggy bank waiting for the day that you have health care? No, you spend it. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly then you, I say to you, uh, Gail, you need a colonoscopy. Well, I've got a high deductible. I'm going to have to pay, um, you know, $1,500 for my colonoscopy, whatever it is. When with a regular plan, I mean, a colonoscopy in theory is covered, but I'm just choosing that as, oh, you're yeah, using I'm just that choosing as that as an example. example. Okay. But basically a high deductible plan only means that you're paying less of a premium and the money's in your pocket, but you should be saving that right. because you're insuring yourself for the first 10,000 mm -hmm. or 5,000, whatever mm -hmm. the high deductible is. And people aren't doing that. They're no. spending it because yes. they got to spend it on life, you know, whatever else. And then when they're faced with a cost, well, I, I, I'll forego that because I can't afford it or whatever. Well, you can't afford it because you spent it because that's the nature of how it goes. Eh. Mm -hmm. Please don't talk to me. It makes me sick. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's just really, really um, a tragedy to see how this is going. Mm -hmm. it, it's, um, mm -hmm. And people are just screaming about the cost and no one's doing anything about it. Except you see that the price of insulin is now $35. They've, of course, of course, because if you go anywhere else, that's what the price is. And uh, why was it so much more before? Uh, because um, 
The pharmaceutical people we're making more money. We're making yes. it, and you look at their profit margins. Uh -huh. They're incredible, totally incredible. And you look at the inflation rate we have. Look at the profits of all the major companies, and you know, they're amazing. But we're still going to the grocery store and paying mm -hmm. when they have not reduced. Except for eggs, eggs have come down quite a bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but basically, uh, as the poor farmers get messed up all the time. But anyway, uh, it, it's it's quite an interesting concept. Mm -hmm. So, well, <laughs> yeah, I hate to say it, but we've come to the end of another episode of Fresh Perspectives. Mm. And thank yeah. you so much for appearing on Fresh Perspectives my, today. My pleasure. And we will have to do that panel discussion with you and Bill Ward. And what was his name? Jim Fincher. Jim Fincher. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be great. Okay. It, it, it would be uh, uh, the the zenith to the nadir, the apogee to the perigee, the beginning to not the end. But mm -hmm. uh, Bill is now the president or the uh, of, of uh, the Rail Sea Trail organization, and I was at the beginning, mm -hmm. and Fincher I'll, was I'll in the middle. I'll see those of you in the viewing audience when we do the next mm -hmm. episode. Well, it it, it was uh, <laughs> it was an amazing.